So what does it mean to be on your grizzly? It means hard work, yeah. dedication, and it means progress be uh -huh. on your grizzly. Hard work, dedication, and progress. I'm on my grizzly, y'all. I'm on my grizzly. I'm on my grizzly, y'all. I'm on my grizzly. I'm on my grizzly, y'all. I'm on my grizzly. And if you're busy making moves, say it with me. I'm on my grizzly, y'all. I'm on my grizzly. I'm on my grizzly, y'all. I'm on my grizzly. I'm on my grizzly, y'all. I'm on my grizzly. And if you're busy making moves, say it with me. Coming to you from the city of angels. This is the Grizzly Podcast with Irvin Scott and Melissa Santos. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our last episode of the season. This is the Grizzly Podcast, and my name is Irvin Scott. And my name is Melissa Santos. What's up, y'all? Ladies and gentlemen, today we are joined by club and radio DJ for Power 106. He is a record producer and a platinum recording artist, signed to So So Deaf slash Island Urban Music. Ladies and gentlemen, our guy here today, Power 106, very own, Felly Fell. What it do? Yeah. How you doing today, brother? Everything good with you? I'm good, man. I, I, I told you I, I was straight off a jog. And I, I realized what time it was, so I, I got. That's why you see the little, little bit of sweat. Where are you from originally? Originally, I'm from Atlanta. Okay. I'm from right. Atlanta. I, I didn't know that, so that's that's good. And I, I mean, for those listening right now, and that didn't know that, um, at least you know we, we know that now. But it's really interesting because people see you as like family, like you are, you know, Felly Fell, like you are LA, hey. so. You were born in Rock Hill, South Carolina. You grew up in Atlanta, L.A., and Dallas. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. So my mom is originally from Charleston. Uh, she grew up on the beach, and she moved to Charlotte to go to college, and that's where she met my dad in, in Rock Hill. Rock Hill is a suburb of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. So my mom went to college out there, met my dad. They had me, and uh, yeah, I, people always ask me, where'd you go to college? And, you know, I didn't go to college, but technically my mom, my mom and dad, divorced. they had me in college and they divorced when my mom was in college. And I ended up getting kind of raised on the campus. They had a nursery back then. And if you had kids, you could keep your kids on the campus. So technically I went to college. I was two. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so I got family in Charlotte. Um, you know, we eventually, my mom and I moved to Atlanta, my mom got remarried and, uh, I, I grew up in Atlanta and when I was 16, we moved here to LA, went to high school here in LA. And then shortly after that, we moved to Dallas. Um, and, and then, you know, 25 years later, you know, I've been here now for 25 years. I moved back, um, uh, sometime later back to LA. So that's the the moving around life story in a nutshell. Um, and I was into sports. Uh, I went to Braves baseball camp, even though I was, a, it was funny. I was a Dodger fan. I was a cowboy living in Atlanta. I was a Dodger fan, a cowboy fan and a Lakers fan. And, uh, you know, I was a kid back then. Those were the teams, you know, I had a neighbor that was a <laughs> cowboy fan that his dad threw these big parties. So I became a cowboy fan. I was a big fan of uh, Magic Johnson. So I was a Laker fan. And uh, back then, the Atlanta team sucked. So when you were a kid, you know, you, you, you went for you tended to go for the, you know, the, the teams that were winning. So I, and, uh, and I, I did go to Braves baseball camp. Baseball was something that was I had done pretty much my whole life up until, you know, 17 years old. Uh, and the music took over. And here I am now. And let's actually jump right into that, because I was actually going to ask you, did like growing up in like all these places or all these areas kind of affect what, you know, what your career would be or what your or oh, what your sure. life would be? Right. Yeah. Because you began spinning turntables for house parties as a teenager. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I started dabbling with DJ in Atlanta. Uh, okay. My my neighbor, which is still my longest. I, I don't know how you would say it. Like everybody's got their longest running friend that they've known for the longest. Uh, his name's Tony Cruz. Tony and I grew up, grew up across the street from each other. And one day I ran across a, a record at his house and I stole it from him, took it home, put some paper towels on my mom's turntable to use as a little, you know, slip mat. And I started mimicking the, it was a, I don't know if you guys remember a song called Roxanne, Roxanne. Yeah, of course. That's that's literally what started like the whole hip hop war stuff with yeah. KRS-One and yeah, 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 absolutely. 
that that was the first record I learned. You know, I learned how to scratch on, and so I was kind of dabbling as a bedroom DJ in Atlanta. Moved to LA, and as you guys know, uh, you know, we eat lunch outside uh, out here. A lot of schools, at least Gary High School, did. And we used to have a DJ every Friday. And then that kind of, you know, I got into that and, you know, just just started really doing house parties and stuff. And then moved to it, moved to Dallas, got into the mixtape club scene, did did mainly Latin clubs. I kind of took it to the I was producing beats for a lot of the rappers in the urban scene in Dallas. But I was DJing at mainly all the Latin clubs. And uh, yeah, that's. That's kind of how all that happened. Okay. Yeah. And speaking of Dallas, so your career actually began on a Dallas radio station, right? It was K104 and uh, Waco, Texas, the Spanish language station, KHCK. You're close. Okay. So Correct. Yeah, that, was, that was the first hip hop station I was on. But I actually started at a community station in Dallas. The station was 89.3 FM. And so it was one of those stations that, you know, one hour they play country, the next hour they played the huddle music, the next hour, you know, they were playing Latin hip hop, next hour they were playing, you know, underground hip hop. So I had a, I had a, um, one of the guys that did a Saturday night show invited me up uh, to, to DJ on his Saturday night show one night as a guest DJ. And that turned into me coming back on a regular basis. Uh, <laughs> it was called the, the Rhythm Nation Power Hour. Uh, shout to Alan Hammer. He was the host. Uh, we, you know, ended up, he would run late sometimes. And I had to kind of, he would call me like, you got to start the show. And that was kind of my introduction into radio. Um, and then from there, I ended up doing um uh, uh, believe it or not, a Spanish station. It was called Kick FM. You somehow, did you want that or or it just kept falling into your lap? Yeah, I mean, I, I it was a little bit of both. I mean, I think I wanted it um, and, and it and it was something that, um, that, that yeah, gravi- I gravitated toward it, it gravitated toward me. Um, I was always in that scene. I guess, you know, if I had to, If I had to guess, it was probably because, um, I, you know, the people that I surrounded myself with, you know, I'm in the cars. I mean, I'm in, I've been in the same car club for, you know, shout out to my elite car club family. I I go back to high school with, with, uh, my boy Albert and, you know, I've been in the cars my whole life. Uh, even before I moved to LA, I was in the low rider scene. I was in the music scene, you know, most of the girls I dated were, were always Latina. So it was, it I'm was sorry. me. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I got, I got two baby mamas to, 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 to accept I'm that sorry. apology. I, thank you, you for that apology skin. on behalf of both my baby mamas. Now nah, they're, they're, they're actually really good. They're good moms. We just didn't work out. The best moms, the best moms. <laughs> yeah. They, 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 in particular, they are, they're, they've been really good moms uh, to both my daughter and my son, but um, so it was, it was me, you know, just growing up in the, the Latin culture, uh, and then, yeah. And then, and then having the opportunities. Um, so yeah, I started, I started doing Latin clubs. Or, oh, I was telling you about the, just, so I got a call from a, a lady named Sammy Gonzalez, uh, which I knew her from the big hip hop pop station in Dallas. She did, I think middays for years. I get a call from her. I had listened to her for years. Uh, and I get a call one day. She's like, Sammy Gonzalez. And I'm like, from 100.3 Jams? And she was like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, what's up? And she was like, I'm a fan of yours. I listen to your show. Um, by that time, I had a, a a show of my own on the the, the community radio station. And uh, 89.3. And she's like, I want to offer you a job. And I was like, oh, OK. And, and she's like, I'm not at 100.3 Jams anymore. I'm programming a Spanish station, a new station called Kick FM. And she said, I'm doing the mornings. I'd, I'd, li- I'd like for you to do nights. And I was like, I mean, my Spanish ain't that great. And, you know, she was like, no, 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 you know, I'm not worried about that. She's like, that's actually why I want you. I want more of a Chicano type style flavor, um, you know, personality. And, and you're a DJ. And I had perfected uh, 
the art of mixing Spanish songs kind of like you do in hip hop. So it was back in the Selena days. You might be familiar with La Mafia, Maz, yeah. uh, David Lee Garza, Los Musicales, like so, groups like that. I was mixing, you know, I would do doubles, you know, you know, on the songs. I go back and forth and she liked that. She heard that that I was, you know, mixing. And that was a lot. Do I got to shout out my boy, Steve Chavez. Steve was one of the first DJs to do that. Jam and Joe Martinez. Uh, and, and, you know, we were known in the city for mixing the Spanish music and all the hip hop and all the up-tempo booty bass, you know, ass shaking music. So she, and she liked, you know, I guess she liked my personality. Anyway, I, I reluctantly took the job because it meant that I was going to have to leave this um this other station so i took it and i remember telling her i'm like man i I, you know i hope i don't have to do an interview or anything she goes nah you know she's like you'll be fine and 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 it ended up being great i mean my ratings went through the roof because you guys know like most of selena's fans didn't speak spanish uh a lot of her fans and and as as herself you know she didn't learn spanish until she started you know she had to learn the the lyrics to her songs and I don't think at the time I took that in consideration. Um, so I was kind of surprised when my show took off the way it did. She ended up moving me to afternoons. Um, and, and I was there for probably a year, a year and a half. A new dude came into program. He took over mornings and we didn't get along. Uh, he was um, upset about my following and and he was trying to get his show going and his name and his brand going. But in, in his defense, I had I had him beat by some years. You know, I had already established myself, you know, in Dallas as a DJ and as a radio personality. And uh it just got awkward. And I, I left and went back to 89.3. They took me back. And um a couple months later, I got the call from the big hip hop station, K104, uh, KKDA. Shout to Nippy Jones. I'll never forget. He called me. He said, hey, they want to holler at you up here. He was doing the night show at the time. And I went in and I called him and the night they asked me to come in for a meeting. And that's how I got the job on the big hip hop station in Dallas. Um, and they're still around and they're still the big station in Dallas. So eventually that all led to L.A., though, right? Finally moving over to uh, the L.A. hip hop station here, which is Power 106. How did that all come about? By the grace of God and luck, um, I had success on K104. I think they wanted me because of my, I, I, I like to thank my skills as a DJ. When they hired me, I should have said this also. They, you know, I thought they were hiring me, you know, as a DJ, DJ, you know, because I was still more of a DJ. I never considered myself an air personality. I was a house or a house, a house party DJ, producer. That somehow ended up on the radio, still doing clubs and mixtapes and producing music. And here I am, you know, kind of being pulled toward the radio personality thing that I wasn't sure about. Um, so when I got this job offer, you know, I remember sitting in there with, with his name was Skip Cheatham. He was the program director and Ken Dow was the station manager. And I remember saying, they said, we want to offer 10, uh, offer you 10 p.m. to midnight, Monday through Friday, or 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., Monday through Friday. And the first thing I thought was, damn, this is going to interfere with my club gigs. Um, and the next thing I thought was, you know, where you guys, I'm going to do a mix show for four hours. And they were like, no, we, we're, we're hiring you as, a, as an air personality. And I remember thinking like, nah, and I, and I, don't, I don't know what I told them, but I ended up working it out to where they let me mix on the turntables for 20 minutes at the top of every hour. So I think it was like 10 to 10, 20, 11 to 11, 20, 12, 12, 21 to 120. And, you know, it gave, it gave me my fix as a DJ. And so that show did, did, I guess, fairly well. And then they ended up moving me to 6 PM to 10 PM to the evening show. Uh, they, they, they teamed me up with, uh, Cocoa Butter and, and Rock T. And we we made up the Tide at Night crew from 6 p.m. to, to 10 to 10 p.m. every evening on K104, which was, you know, 
just just having that opportunity in general, I was going to say being on that show, uh, you know, but just having the opportunity to be on such a big station was awesome for me. Um, yeah. And I, that led to, to, to the job at power 106 and, um, how that happened was, um, you know, I was still, um, trying to pursue my, my music as a producer. Um, and I took a week off. I think I had been at K104 at that point for maybe, maybe three years. And, uh, I took a week off and went to LA um, I think that in the back of my mind was, was where I always knew I, I wanted to be. Um, uh, I understood the city. I, I felt like that was where I needed to be. Um, and so I took a week off, um, set up a bunch of meetings, you know, being on the radio, I knew a lot of the record label promoters and, and a lot of the promoters, I called them and said, Hey, I, I need to, I need to get some A&R meetings popping. I'm coming to LA. And, uh, Got a bunch of meetings set up, went out to L.A., was staying at the, I want to say Hyatt off of you know, Sunset, Sink Sunset in Hollywood, and was going to these meetings. I think the second or third day I was here, I got a call from a buddy of mine, uh, shout to Buys One. He's still an amazing record promo promoter to this day. Buys called me and told me he was going to play basketball at DJ Quick's house. And then he knew I played ball and he asked me if I wanted to go. And I was like, hell to the yeah. <laughs> so uh, he he comes and picks me up in my hotel. He had to make a stop at Power 106 to drop off some vinyl to some DJs. And, you know, doing, doing his job, he was promoting records. And we stop up there and he's like, come, you know, come in with me. And I was excited because, you know, I wanted to see the station. Uh, I was very familiar with Power um, at the time the only personalities I was really familiar with were the Baker boys and I, and I, and, and big boy. And, um, you know, and, and that just goes to show you how big the Baker boys were, um, yeah. and, you know, and big boy, uh, they were, you know, I knew who they were and I was living in Dallas and maybe it was partly because I, I, I had lived out here and gone to high school out here. And, but, but, um, anyway, I was excited to come, come up to the station and, he goes into to this guy's office and we get upstairs and he's, you know, I guess, you know, giving his pit, pitch, promoting his records. And uh, I'm standing out in the hall and I see this this kid in there and he's looking at me. I'm looking at him I'm like, I know this dude, but I didn't want to interrupt. They end up coming out in the hall and it was DJ E-Man and E-Man introduces someone. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm like, I know you. And, and he reminded me that we had partied in Miami a couple of years before at a at a loud records uh party loud records for everybody who doesn't know uh is known for uh you know e e exhibit was on loud records uh wu-tang clan i mean I, I can keep going on and on but um the huge record label steve rifkin threw this big party and he said remember we had the champagne in there we were you know pouring champagne out you know popping bottles and i was like ah, i remember you so we started talking and I and remember, I'm telling you, it was a lot of luck. I was at the right place at the right time. Um, and he was like, man, we're, we're, you know, I heard what, you know, you're doing in Dallas. And, and, and a lot of that is probably due. And I don't know what buys one, what his role was, the, the record promoter I was with. But I think he had told E-Man, like, you need to meet, you know, Felly. Um, he's in town from Dallas. So he, he ended up knowing me. We started talking. He's like, we're looking for a night guy. And I was like, oh, uh, and he's like, you have an air check. I didn't have an air check demo tape on me. That's not why I was in L.A. I was in L.A. to look for, you know, to sell my beats as a producer. So anyway, he ends up introducing me to the program director, Jimmy Steele at Power 106. He comes down the hall. I think he asked me for a demo. <laughs> I had to explain to him I don't have a demo. And. He asked me if I could, when I got back to Dallas, if I could, if I could send a demo. So I did. I basically got on the air, hit record, and however that show sounded, that's that's what I said. Some of you might not know what an air check is. So, Feli, can you explain yeah. what an air check is to, to yeah. those wondering what we're talking about right now? This is the term. Yeah, it would be like a demo, like if you guys were a singing group, uh, you know, if, if you guys wanted a record label to hear your demo, it basically an air check tape is a demo tape. So it, it lets the, the radio station 
for a lack of a better way to put it, um, hear how you sound as a radio DJ personality. Uh, and, and, and back in the day, you could put it because when you were on the air, you could record your show. You could put a cassette in, <laughs> hit record, or you could put a, a, a mini disc in, hit record. And whenever you turned on the mic during your show, it would record. And when you turn your mic off, it would pause the tape. So at the end of your show, you could go back and listen to only the vocal parts of your show. Uh, so you could hear how you sounded on the air. That way you didn't have four hours of, you know, most radio shows are four hours. You would have four hours of stuff to scroll through to find your talk breaks. Right. So an air check tape gives, you know, you could listen to your whole four hour show in 20 minutes because it only picks up the vocals. So um, I had, I did an air check tape, sent it in, um, never heard back from Jimmy Steele. It, it seemed like a lifetime. And my girlfriend at the time, I think she she saw that I was kind of, you know, sweating it. And I remember her telling me, uh, you know, at one point she's like, they just don't know what you got. You know, she's trying to make me feel better. And um, I ended up getting a call, I think like three weeks later from Jimmy. And he said, man, I'm so sorry. I, I was on a second honeymoon in Hawaii. and <laughs> I just got a chance to listen to your air check tape. And he's like, man, we love it. Uh, I remember I remember him telling me, you know, Big Boy really, really liked your your tape. Uh, DJ E-Man, uh, Damian Young at the time, who was um, uh, I think he was the assistant program director was his title. And he's like, we all love it. You know, and he, he they we we'd love to have you back out here. They brought me back out actually the next week after that for for um, a big powerhouse show. And at the time, I didn't know what Powerhouse was. Uh, I think I had heard of it. But I think they wanted me to come out on that weekend because all of the station would be together. I could meet everybody. Uh, they could meet me. And that's what we did. And uh, they ended up offering me a job. <laughs> and here it is 21 years later. You're talking about them hearing your, your air check and everyone was digging it. What's going through your mind, basically, when you, you hear about big boy actually digging what you had and you know everybody else is kind of complimenting you on on your skills so what's going through your mind at that point i mean i you know to have somebody of and big boy at the time was i don't want to say just turning into big boy but he was you know this was the time where he had the big billboards with him in a bathtub with the rubber ducky and you know yeah. you know yeah yeah uh, and big boy was turning into big boy and me being a DJ and a radio dude, you know, I had heard about him and to have somebody of, of, of his um, stature, if you will, um, you know, critique my, my air check, even take that time. Now, who knows? He may have just heard it passing by. I was like, yeah, the dude sounds good. But, uh, but to have to find out that he, that he gave me his blessings was, um, was a big deal to me and, and still is to this day. I mean, uh, I, I hold big boy near and dear to my heart, um, not just because we worked together for almost 20 years, uh, you know, but just because I, I learned so much from him uh, over the years. Um, and, and, and just the fact that he, he embraced me, uh, that means a lot to me. Um, so, so, yeah, it was it was on and popping from there. And. And we 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 had a, a really amazing run. Uh, those those were, you know, I've had a great time and I still do every day on the air. Uh, I'm real. I'm real blessed to to have the support um, of the listeners here in L.A. to, um, you know, and that, that means a lot to me. You were embraced by L.A. and, you know, they literally. Uh, d dubbed you the record maker and the record breaker. So uh, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I, I, I make records, uh, I produce them, uh, you know, ended up getting the, the, a big record deal. Um, and I, and I break records. Uh, you know, I, I listen to music, find things that I think are, are relevant to our listener and I play them and, you know, it's, I've had some success doing that with with helping other artists 
so yeah, you know, you make records and you break records and they, it just kind of stuck. Um, right. Was it something that you came up with yourself or was it like somebody else who just kind of came up with the idea? No, it was um, some artist, you know, artists would come up and do drops. Like, you know, this is Jay-Z, you checking out my dog, Felly Fell, the heavy hitter, you know, stuff like that. I can't remember what artist, I think it was Jermaine Dupree. Uh, Jermaine Dupree, ironically, who's, you know, signed me to So So Deaf Island Def Jam. Jermaine gave me a drop one day and it says, you know, the record breaker and the record maker, you know, which actually he got that, as you know, that's a that's an old line from a Run DMC song. But JD, when he did me the, the little drop, he's like, you know, y'all are checking out my boy Felly Fell in the mix, the, the, the record maker and the record breaker uh, right here on Power 106. And I would play that drop a lot. <laughs> because I, I was a I was, you know, a big fan of JD. I still am. Um, you know, we ended up becoming, you know, friends over the years. Um, and it just it was just something to stop. And let's talk about JD while we're on the same subject here. Uh, eventually, you signed with Island Def Jam. So, so deaf in 2007. How did that whole process come about? You know, JD was dating Janet at the time. And he was always here in L.A. I think J.D. was here in L.A. a lot <laughs> before he dated Janet, uh, just because he was um, he was he was always out here producing songs. He would always hear me on the air. J.D. was a record pr pr producer, label owner um, that was very proactive in not only his music, but his artists that he signed. So, you know, Bow Wow and and Jagged Edge and, and all those groups over the years that Jermaine produced, you know, obviously Mariah Carey um, wasn't signed to So So Deaf, but, you know, she was with Def Jam. He was very proactive. He would listen to the radio, you know, him being a DJ and him being out here in L.A. And he would hear me on the air. And and one and, you know, we became friends through that. Me, you know, me knowing him through the, rec the, the music industry. And one day I invited him up. Uh, or, or the station set up an interview. JD was up there, and I remember telling him, "Like you're a DJ, man. Come on, man, do do my mix today." And and so he got in there on the turntables, and to my surprise, he asked me about a record that I produced. He's like, "You you did this record? It's crazy." And I didn't even know he knew about it. It was a song called "It Was Get Buck in Here," and he was like, "Man, I want to play that shit." And he ended up playing it like five times on the air that day. We get off the air and he was like, man, this, this record is a hit. It was featuring um, Akon, Luda, Lil John, and P. Diddy. And he was just, he, I remember him telling me like, damn dog. <laughs> you know, he was like, this shit is crazy. And he ended up asking me about the features and how I went about it. And um, one thing led to another. And he, 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 he said, I want to talk to you about doing a deal. I have a new imprint over at, at Island Def Jam. I'm taking So So Def over there. And that's that's how it happened. And I, you know, I ended up going on to go double platinum uh, thanks to Jermaine and Island Def Jam. Wow. And it took me around the world. It took me around the world. I went from being a local DJ to, you know, traveling the world. I mean, uh, it changed my life. You know, it changed my life. You did release your debut album, which was uh, Go DJ. That was the uh, title of the album. And that basically had various artists included or, or featured on the album. Uh, yeah. What was it like working on that project? So, so that, that album never officially came out. I, I actually only worked on singles uh, because during that time, I think part of it was I, was, uh, I, I wasn't confident. I think I had a, a big fear of, you know, it seems to be uh, <laughs> something I battle with uh, for a long time. Um, you know, fear of failure, uh, and, and in some cases, fear uh, of success. Um, I think sometimes we do things to purposely sabotage things so that we don't have to deal with stuff. Um, I think it would it made more sense for me, and I felt more comfortable coming out with singles. So, I, you know, I came out with Get Buck in here. Then I came out with Finer Things, which was a song with Kanye and Neo. And uh, Jermaine was on that song, Fabulous. Then I came out with another single with T-Pain, Pitbull, Sean Paul. 
and Flo Rider. And the pattern there with those songs, you know, and then I went on to do songs with CeeLo Green and Juicy J and Wiz and, and, and you know, I, I, I can keep going. But each time I, I needed, I, I, I came out with songs that were relevant for the sound that at that time. And that goes, I think, for me being a DJ. Um, and it's not that I didn't have desi the desire to do an album. I just... I just didn't have it in me, uh, to be, to be honest with you, you know, it was easier and I felt more comfortable. Uh, I think also me being a perfectionist for me to do an album would have took two years. Uh, you know, whereas a single, I could, you know, do it in three or four or five months, which is what some people do a whole album in five months. And I think it goes back to me being such a perfectionist. I found that, man, I can't, I can't do that. I, I it takes me four or five months to do a single. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> no, I mean, and, and everyone works differently. You know, uh, we all work at our own pace, but uh, I mean, I actually thought that the, the album had dropped. A lot of people did because yeah. they would see, you know, little advertisements or little blogs and, you know, I, to this day, very disappointed in myself. Um, that was something that I never was able to do. Uh you know, and that's 100 percent just on, on me. And, uh, you know, I think another part of it was I got a taste of the industry uh, from a lot of different angles. I got a taste of the industry from the radio side, a taste of the industry from the club side, a taste from uh, the, uh, of the industry from um, being signed as an artist. You know, I, I went from. Seeing, knowing what it was like to interview an artist that would come through LA uh, on the radio, to to going on a a, a record um, uh, tour, a promotional tour around the country, promoting my records, and I would see it was it was very uncomfortable for me uh, because you know I knew what it was like to be on the other side of that, and I remember being interviewed by a lot of radio people that were. DJs that wished that they were in LA, that wished that they were on a big station like Power. A lot of DJs, they were also producers that were that, that were trying to get where I was at. And, you know, I dealt with a lot of reluctancy and people wanting to interview me. Uh, I also dealt with a lot of people wanting to interview me because they genuine, genuinely were, were like, man, that's dope. We're happy for this guy. He, he's one of us. And he's, he's, you know, he's quote unquote made it. I never have considered that I made it, but that, you know, that saying, and I remember just being real uncomfortable. Like this isn't, you know, it just was uncomfortable. And I think that was another reason that kind of, you know, you get your feet wet with something, right. And you realize, you know, whether it's for you or not, I love producing music. I realized that I don't think I want to produce stuff for me and go promote this stuff. I, I didn't, I didn't care about the fame either. Uh, I think that's another thing that motivates some artists, not all artists. Um, that's not what motivated me. Uh, I actually have social anxiety, which is something that I, I, I didn't realize I had until recently, which is odd. F go figure, you know, I've DJ clubs all over the world. Um, but I think I always have my little domain, like right there in the DJ booth. I could come in, do my thing, yay, and then leave. Um, whereas if I'm in a just a, at an event, I can't be at just a regular event. I, I I've done it, and it just man, it's, it's it's been tough for me. So I'm more of a produce a song in my room in my studio, which is what you see in here, and 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 put it out in the world, and you know hope that something comes about it or produce what I'm getting into more now is producing songs for other artists, not so much songs for myself, um, which I've never done. I've never shopped my beats to artists. The only time artists have, uh, I know I've never shopped my beats to artists for them. I've always shopped my music for songs that I was working on. So now I'm, now I'm, uh, I'm doing a little more of that. Yeah, no, you know, I would have never guessed that you were the type to have like some so, some sort of social anxiety. Like, I guess, you know, we're all kind of like, you know, in our own mind sometimes, man. And uh, I never would have thought that because I, I always thought I you were like a, a lot very... of artists are, though. Yeah, I think a lot of 
it, it's in, it's an interesting thing. I, I I come across a lot of people who are in the public in a public space. Mm-hmm. Um, like that's what they do for a living. Like like yourselves, even though even though you 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 know you're in a booth and you're saying that it's a little bit more separate from everyone else, but you're still public, right? So um, I know a lot of artists that are just like, oh man, I do what I need to do and then I get out and then I have to recharge my batteries, you know? Like I can't, I can't do that all the time. Although find a facet of their artistic like career and then they like focus a little bit more on that and that's more comfortable for them. But yeah, I get it. I, I have major social anxiety. That's why I'm telling you. And I will be in front of like, thousands of people emceeing and doing that and then as soon as i'm done i'm like whoo all right i'm done but i love doing it it's you're really drained you're drained I drained i get drained and <laughs> have to recharge and i have to be by myself doing with something creative on my own and then i like fill up my tank and then i go and i do it again so yeah trust me, i know what that's like and, yeah. and the crazy thing is apparently some people get charged by that i get drained i get drained and I don't understand. I mean, everybody's different. That just goes to show. But yeah, I, it, it's such a, you know, it, it's just like, man, this isn't fun. Like, I, <laughs> what the fuck did I sign up for? And that's that's probably, you know, a lot of people over the years have brought up, you know, don't, you know, Khaled, that's your boy. And, you know, we came up at the same time. And, you know, matter of fact, if you go back and look, Khaled is in my Get Buck video because when we shot Diddy's part, it was Diddy was in Miami at his Miami house at the time. And, and we had to shoot it out there. And, and I called Khaled, you know, he was on the air uh, on a station in Miami at the time. And I was like, Hey, I'm coming out to shoot this video. And he's in the video. Um, we came up at the same time. Um, I think, you know, cause I know a lot of people want to know this cause I get it all the time. Do you look at Khaled as competition or, you know, don't you want to be more, don't you want to come out with albums like Khaled? And I think to myself, <laughs> do I look at Khaled as competition? Hell to the no. I mean, that man has put out album after album after album. And it's funny, you get people that, you know, I think they think that maybe someone in my position is jealous of um, Khaled. Absolutely not. Because I know what that do, what it took for him to go through to record all this music. Uh, and I applaud him. I think one of the things he probably also ha- has over me uh, is, is, um, he 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 doesn't have the social anxiety. Yeah, you know, as we you know, everybody you could tell you see him hosting stuff and out and about. Um, he 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 likes that, um, and I you know I don't. I like being successful. I like having songs that I produce. You know, the ego. The, don't get me wrong. There is a just because I don't like the fame part of it doesn't mean that I don't have an ego. I think my ego is fed with different nutrients. My, my ego is fed by, um, you know, work, you know, having a successful song. Uh, my ego is fed by, you know, uh, not not by the fame part of it. And I'm not I'm not saying Khaled wants just is fed by the fame. Uh, I think he's a real talented DJ. People don't realize that about Khaled. He, he, he is a real DJ. And I think he's got a great ear and, and is a great A&R and producer. Uh, but he has that 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 little added element that I don't have, um, nor do I, do I want it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, everybody's different and that's what I tell people. I I'm different. Um, you know, and and so, so here I am and I'm, I'm, I'm real blessed. I'm, um, very fortunate. You've worked with the likes of Chris Brown. You mentioned Akon earlier. Uh, you know, and we talked about the self-produced hits, uh, like The Finer Things. That was Kanye West, Jermaine Dupree, Fabulous, Neo. But I want to talk to you about uh, Kanye, man. Uh, I know he's a, he- well, I don't know if he is now. He was a heavy hitter. You're a heavy, heavy hitter. hitter. For, heavy hitter for life. How did that come about, man? Like uh, the collaboration with Kanye. The way that the Kanye thing came about, part of it was, yeah, you know, he, he was a heavy hitter. I don't even know him. He might not even have been a heavy hitter at the time. Yeah, no, he was. He was. Um, he was yeah. just coming out. Kanye, I remember, was a producer. Uh, he had produced, I can't remember which Jay-Z song it was. I think it was Izzo, H to the Izzo, if I'm not mistaken. God mm-hmm. forgive me if my, my hip-hop knowledge is off. I'm the worst with names and stats. It's been a um, while, man. I mean, you know, we're talking about like early 2000s. Yeah. yeah. So I, anyway, I played this song on the air. It, it was a big song. 
he ended up rapping on it himself. Like he had did this song for Jay Z. He did his own version of it. I, it, I don't think it was H to the Izzo. It was. It was. I can't remember what song it was, but he ended up sending me a version of him rapping on it. And he and, and he wanted to see what I thought. It was back when we would get in, emails, MP3s from artists and labels. And I remember hearing this, and I'm like, "Oh, this shit is dope." Kanye, the producer, he can rap. And I I played it on the air. Kanye never forgot that. Um, because L.A. was such, you know, he was always out here working on music and, you know, I'm sure his phone blew up and he heard me play it on the air multiple times. So it was him rapping on a Jay-Z song that he produced that kind of solidified uh, our relationship. He was a heavy hitter. Um, we would we would we would see each other at all kind of events. Um, and that we just developed a relationship, you know, where we could, you know, you know, we would call and text. He would ask me about songs, what I thought, uh, which is very flattering. And, and, and it just developed into a relationship. One day I did a, I did a song and I heard Neo on it. And I called Neo and I said, Hey man, I need a hook, bro. And he gave me a hell of a hook in finer things. And, um, as a producer, the way I work, and I think a lot of people make songs like this, you produce the beat, you do the hook. And at that point, who do I hear rap rapping on the verses? And, and the first person that came to my mind was, was Kanye. So I got a hold of him, um, sent him the song, uh, and he killed it. And, and that was how, that was how, how, how it came about. Um, you know, and then we, we went on, we, we were going to do some other stuff. We were in Hawaii. He was living in Hawaii shortly after that. I went out there to, to see him in Hawaii and he was dating. Um, oh, what's her name? Yeah. Yeah. My, I know who, uh, Wiz Khalifa's uh, ex-wife. Yeah. What's yeah, yeah. her name? Uh, Amber Rose. <laughs> Amber Rose. He was dating Amber at the time. I go out there. We're hanging. We were in the studio. Um, he was letting me hear a, a lot of music. I was letting him hear stuff. We were due to work on another project, but we ended up playing basketball every fucking day and <laughs> getting fucked up every night. <laughs> and um, and it's funny because I remember Amber every day. We he had this gym that he would rent out in Hawaii. He had a house out there, and we would go to this gym, and all the homies would ball every day. We'd be in the studio at night, and um, it was fun. I, I never got another song done though. But that's you know, and then Kanye just kept getting bigger. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now he's a one of the richest people in the world. That is crazy, right? How much has changed over the years. But, you know, one, one guy that always had uh, just money and, and he was just making moves back in the day was Diddy. Uh, we talked about that track earlier, the Get Buck in Here. So you did that track with Akon, Luda, Lil John, and Diddy. What was it like working with Diddy? Because I know he's like a perfectionist as well. So did he have like any say in the song as well as far as like oh. how it should sound and all that? So there, there, he's on two verses of that song where, you know, most of the time you do a song as a DJ, you got one verse of this artist, you know, one verse of this artist and this you hear you hear Diddy on the song twice on two different parts because and I didn't expect that um, I sent him the song he loved it and he did three verses and I'm like Puff I only need one verse and he was like nah man it, it ended up I ended up putting two of the three verses so there is actually a third Puff Daddy there's a did a third Diddy verse. Sean Combs verse that is somewhere in my archives here in the studio, but uh, he didn't, he, he, we did go back and forth, uh, back and forth on his verses. I don't remember what it was about, but he was a, uh, he is a, a, a tough dude man. and he knows how he wants his shit. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, did he, did he wants it done his way? For sure. I can't I can't tell you how many takes there were of us sending the song back and forth, getting in the lab, trying to figure out the best how to make it sound. And um, I think I, I may have edited something and he was like, no, nah, I don't leave that in there. And then there was another thing that he took out. And I'm like, why'd you take that out? That shit was dope. And he was, you know, so we ended up coming to an agreement eventually. Uh, but I respect the shit out of him because he's, you know, that guy, uh, I found myself, I don't want to say in arguments with him, uh, during that, that song, but it was definitely 
difficult because at the time, you know, you have your idea as a producer and as an artist of how you want something to sound, you know, and I found myself in these deep, deep, uncomfortable sometime conversations with Puff. It was kind of surreal thinking back on it. You remember the band, you know, he had them chase for the cheesecake. So I, I can imagine mm-hmm. just what it was with music, you know, it was probably a complicated situation to go through, but at the end of the day, Puff knows what he wants and he'll get it done regardless, I guess. So, I mean, it is what it is. Shout out to Diddy. You know, I, I was a Ciroc boy when he first started Ciroc. Uh, he promoted via DJs. Um, and that that was an interesting situation. When when we did the, the video for that song, he had, a, you know, he had a, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a writer uh, for the video shoot. And I remember getting to the video shoot and this was in Miami. The lady or the girl was like, you want to see Diddy's writer? And I'm like, hell yeah. Looking at it, and I remember it had uh, Simply Lemonade on the rider. And that was when Simply Lemonade had just started popping. And I remember like, oh, shit, I love Simply Lemonade. He invites me back to his little area, and he's like, he pulls out this bottle with a blue dot on it. And he's like, you a vodka drinker? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I want you to try something. Oh, I asked him, what, what's up with the Simply Lemonade? He goes, oh, I'm, I, I, I'm going to show you why I got that. He pulls out the Simply Lemonade, pulls out the bottle with the blue dot. He's like, I want to make you a drink. You a vodka drinker? Makes me a drink. And, and, and he's like, what do you think? And I'm like, it's great. <laughs> like, like I'm some fucking, you know, vodka connoisseur taster. <laughs> all, all I tasted was a cold ass, you know, <laughs> lemonade and vodka. But <laughs> my response. My, my response to him was like, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> and uh, he's like, good, because this is going to be in the video. And, and so if you ever look at the end of Get Buck video, you know, a bottle is held up. I think Def Jam ended up having to bleep it out part of it because uh, it wasn't an official branding sponsorship of <laughs> whatever. But that led to him talking about, yeah, I want to promote, you know, this vodka and you know, this, this whole idea of having DJs promote the vodka. And I got, I got some nice checks from Diddy on that, that led to that. So uh, thank you Puff, for all the Ciroc vodka checks. <laughs> that can't, that ended up coming to an end probably five, five or six years later, because at that point he started getting big artists to endorse and the DJ campaign kind of went away. But Rick Ross, French Montana, uh, got involved um, and Cali. You talked about uh, earlier about how, you know, sometimes there was people that wanted to interview. Some people didn't want to interview you. Uh, I just want to say, Matt, I'm actually grateful that you actually decided to take this interview on, especially because, you know, growing up in LA, man, Power 106 was basically my life. You know, it was everything growing up. I was always a hip hop head and I'm sure Melissa as well, growing up in LA as well. We stayed listening to hip hop music. You know, it's just, it's just part of the culture out here in LA. And for me, man, just listening to you as a kid, um, you know, was always just cool to hear, uh, especially because, you know, I, I pursued a career in hip hop uh, at one point. Yeah. At one point before the podcast, I was a hip hop artist. And I remember you always did something that was always very cool. It always stood out to me. The woke call, which I don't know a lot of people know about anymore or they don't talk about anymore. But the woke call was the ish, man. It was basically people calling up to the station at the time. Yeah. Battle yeah. rappers were in. Did What's you ever call no, I, I never called. I was a little scared because I felt like I wasn't at that level yet, you know, but over yeah. time, I, I felt like, you know, I, I would have called in had I, you know, done that. But I don't know if it was still around at that point, because I think, yeah. Fally, that, that, that was phased out eventually, right? Wow, though. Yeah, the, the woke call, man, that was that was some of the most. Most fun that I have, I've ever, you know, that I ever had a radio, uh, you know, it was it was back in the day where you could put people on the air live. And if they said, fuck shit, damn ass, it didn't matter. Um, you know, we would we would we would screen these um, uh, participants and say, hey, make sure you don't cuss. And they were like, yeah, no problem. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but it was it was a lot of fun. Um, it, it the the woe, car, the woe, you know, Black Rob, woe, rest, rest in peace, uh, Black Rob. That beat was just like I remember like one day thinking like, what? what beat could I have, you know, listeners freestyle over? And um, that I, I just, I remember going through a bunch of my vinyl. I'm like, this one, this is the one. And I remember thinking like, oh, whoa, the woke call. Like, um, and that's, that's how that came about. Um, so 
Um, and I think the Baker boys had something called the roll call. I'm not sure. I don't think it was a freestyle thing. I think I'm not sure what the roll call was, but, but that just goes to show how big the Baker boys, what an impact they made out here because people would always say, Oh, you got to get on Felly's roll call. And I would be like, it's not the roll call. It's the woe call. Uh, the woe call led to, we would get a lot of singers call up and, and we were like, Hey, this is a rap battle. This is not this is, this is a singing battle. So it, it, it ended up spawning into a different segment on the show called the soul call, which allowed singers to call up and showcase their singing capabilities. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was very interesting. And, and I'll tell you a little secret. When we would screen these singers for the soul call, we would always make it a point to, to find one singer that was awful because it didn't start off like that. But, but we, uh, as we did the soul call, I think we probably got like a month into it. We realized like, dude, whenever we got a singer on here that like cracks or that like really like, oh, shit, you ever been watching a national anthem and, and somebody cracks and like, I don't know about y'all. But like the artist human side of me goes, oh, I feel so bad for you. But then there's another side. It's like, oh, shit, that shit is fucking funny. It's like when somebody, your homie running and falls, oh. you, you <laughs> laugh first and then you ask, are you all right? Second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? And so we realized like the, the, the soul call, we always need to have one of the three singers. So we would screen the calls and we would pick the worst fucking singer. Uh, and it's so bad, man. I shouldn't even. <laughs> okay, so legit, these people are like, hell yeah, I seem good. <laughs> like, they're just like, damn. <laughs> and that was that was what got me is like, and you know, it's like, who in your family, somebody in your family, hey, do people not love friends. you? Does they your boyfriend love you. not love you, girl? Because <laughs> they ain't telling you the truth. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, fella, that's so like, crazy. We, it, it happens though. I know a girl like that right now that puts stuff on Instagram that I'm girl. I'm still trying to. I'm working on my singing girl. career. And, and I'm you just, don't, hey, but hey, but I bet you haven't had the heart to say, girl. It's hard, right? Because then what happens is I've showed her to you. You know if that she makes it. You were the hater. Exactly. And then it's like, oh wow, Melissa said this, and it's like, no, Melissa's your only friend, girl. Like I, I'm just so straight up that I'm like. Damn, like I like to sing. I know I'm no Mariah Carey, but I'm not going. I mean, no one is really, right? But I'm not putting it on Instagram and like singing to the camera, making eye contact and shit. Yeah. Like, what the fuck is going yeah, there, on? There's some people that believe their own hype, bro. It really oh, is like that, you know? Nothing. This girl has her husband on there going, wow, baby, good job. And then like some random dude from India who goes, oh, hot, baby. And you're like, great. <laughs> Yo, we're going to hell. Yo. <laughs> no, you know what? Shit, you better sing because there's people out there with like talent, talent. You know what I'm saying? Let me tell you. Let me. So that's a good that's a good segue into this. No. So let me tell you, there are definitely people out there with talent. We would we had some great singers on on on, on the soul call. Um, and one in particular, his name was Miguel. And he ended up going on to be Miguel. And uh it's funny every time I see Meg, and the funny thing, we never did a song together. That's he's he's one artist that I really wish that I would have worked with, uh, and probably could have. Um, I just for whatever reason, I, I we we never, what I never asked saying? him, and he probably would have said he probably would have said no. Um, but it's funny every time I see that dude, he's like fell and he hugs me because you know the first time he got his shot on the soul call. Uh, and and I'll see him at events to this day, to this day. I think the last time was probably about three years ago. It was pre-pandemic. I can't remember what show it was, but he he got on stage and he's like, I want to shout out my boy Felly Fell, you know, the, the first time I was ever on radio. And it's just, you know, it's surreal, man. It's like, damn, that's that's just that's just crazy. How does that feel? Like, right, you know, we joke about the other stuff, but like having kind of having created like this 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 place for them to come and showcase so that the world can see them, especially during a time where social media was not as like, you can't just upload something on Snapchat or whatever, wherever you're at, whatever socials you're on. Like, how does that feel to be able to, like you, in a way, like, cult, not, I don't want to say cultivated that, but you, you gave them like a voice, like, so that people could hear them. I definitely didn't cultivate it, but yeah, to, 
the station created that space. I just, um, I just uh, uh, put it in motion and put my swag on it and put my ideas into it. And I was really blessed to have um, a radio station that understood the importance of allowing talent to be talent. Um, you know, I, I'm 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 grateful for that because. You know, I, I, I have a, I've seen a lot of DJs on radio stations over the years that didn't have that. They didn't have a they didn't work for a station that um, allowed the talent to be the talent. And, and, and they trusted my ear. That was another big thing. Uh, they, they trusted that I was going to play songs that fit the, the, the culture at that moment. Um, God knows I probably played a lot of songs that, that didn't fit. You know, I, I also, I did in my defense, I would try to help people. And sometimes the songs weren't worthy of the airwaves and it, and, and it, and over the years, it's been tough. I mean, I've lost a lot of friendships with artists, uh, because I didn't play their songs. And I, and if I could talk to those artists, what I would tell them is like, do me a favor and go back and look at that song and tell me if I was wrong. Because nine times out of ten, the song ended up not being a big song. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not how people think. They don't look back and be like, well, Felly was right. <laughs> Every once in a while. And if they did, it was kind of like bygones be bygones. And I think that's one thing I've never really talked about a lot was, you know, people like to um, people like to gra uh, sway toward the how great it must have been, you know, f it is for me to um be around these celebrities and artists and, and have the opportunity to work with them. But what they don't understand is how many times things didn't pan out that way, where there's a lot of artists that felt like um, they, you know, oh man, you know, they just didn't work out uh, for whatever reason. That's been something that's as an artist, because I was an artist before I got on radio. I was a DJ before I got on radio. I was, um, you know, so it's very hurtful to know that, you know, there's people that look at you as the end all be all, or if you don't, if, you know, especially back then it was like, if Feli doesn't play my record and I didn't ask for that, I did not want to be the quote unquote, you know, gatekeeper, uh, you know, prior to that as a DJ, my job was to figure out what the hot records I needed to have in my record crate to take to the party. Um, and it was no harm, no foul, you know, and it, and it, and it turned into, um, figuring out what records I need to have in my record crate to play on the air that are the hot new shit that could, you know, I didn't know that it was going to change people's careers. You know, I didn't know when I played I'm Sprung by T-Pain, it was going to change that man's life. Um, you know. I didn't know that not playing a record for an artist may have been the reason that they got dropped from the label. And it took me years to realize, like, it's not just me, you know, you know, the ego in you, especially at the time, the ego was like, yeah, see, you know, I, I play a record, man, this, this, this is the shit. Um, but it was also another, you know, it was very hurtful to know that I could have been the reason why somebody lost a deal. And it took me a long time to realize that wasn't me that, that did that. Did that. Uh, that was the artist. And it goes both ways. And I tell artists like, hey, you did that. You made those songs. I just played them. But it works the other way, too. You made that shitty song. I just didn't play it. So that's on you. And it, and it took me a long time to realize that. These different moving parts. You're just part of this like moving part that is like, this music industry so i just feel like it's easy to just go well it's your fault because the same ego goes i can't oh, accept that it was me right yes the artist is, i can't accept that it was me i can't accept the fact that i can't sing for you know what i mean like you know it's what it is it's our ego or you can't or in some cases you can sing it just the song you did was Not that, that wasn't a hit it. And, it's still part and, of the whole machine, right? So you're just part of yeah. that. So I can understand how you could probably take that on for yourself, like, and go, man, like, kind of get in your own head and go, damn, like, and feel bad about that because you, you know. Yeah, like, especially as an artist. Yeah. yeah, as a producer, like, I know what it's like to not have my record play. 
Yeah. And, 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 and it's not, how do you tell somebody their baby's ugly is the saying I've always said over the years. Yeah, you can't. Right. If you've been, <laughs> if your record is now on a piece of vinyl on a CD or nowadays it's on Spotify, you have put in a lot of work to get to that point where your song is quote unquote out. So if you've put all that, this is my theory. If you've put all that work in to your song or your project, you obviously believe in it. And if you believe in it, that if, so, if somebody tells you anything but that, they are the devil. And like I said, I, 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 what I realized over the years is, man, I'm not cut. I, I never asked for this. Um, and I found myself in very precarious situations, um, if you will. Um, to the point where I think, you know, I kind of, sabotaged a lot of stuff. I, I didn't want it. I didn't want that. You know, I, I kind of just kind of slowly was like, I don't, I don't care if I'm, if I'm not that guy that break, breaks a record. I just, I slowly just kind of re I realized that's not that important to me, uh, which at one time it was very important. I'm the guy before radio more than I am the radio guy. I love being in the studio uh, I love the creative aspect of it. Um, don't get me wrong. I love being a, D a DJ booth, seeing people respond to my selections. But I like being in the DJ booth with my guys doing our thing and then we leave. Um, I like being in a studio in the quiet of my domain. Um, and I like being on the air in my little mix room, live on the air. And people probably look at cats like me like, Oh, you know, Felly's probably always doing this or that. Man, if I ain't in that on-air studio um, with Messy Less, shout out to my, my producer, Messy Less. Um, and by the way, she's on another side of the window. So I'm literally in there by myself. Then I'm in my studio by myself. Or um, I'm in a DJ booth. And I usually tell the promoters, like, hey, man, I don't, you know, I in it. You know, or my guys will tell him, hey, you know, he, he likes to like kind of be by himself in the booth. And sometimes that could come across as arrogant. Um, but it's really just me. Like, I just want to come in here and do my job. I, I don't want to be around a lot of people, especially now with the pandemic. You know, I barely just got back out um, doing gigs and traveling at that doing gigs. So but yeah, I, I I'm a homebody, man. And, and it's the power of technology that makes it seem like it's different, but if I'm not in the studio. I'm out that back door in that swimming pool, uh, or I'm out walking my dog. You know, being that this is a grizzly podcast, man, we have a lot of people that just listen for inspiration. So, you know, the show represents everybody that's constantly on their hustle, constantly on their grind, man. That's somebody like you. Who, you know, you basically embody what we do here. So if you were to offer any advice to anybody coming up right now, man, just following their dreams, what would you say to them? I would start off by saying, be realistic with your dreams. Something that kind of goes back to what, um, what we, we touched on earlier about people. You have to know your strong points as well as your weaknesses. And you have to uh, be very honest with yourself. Um, it's something that I've had to do, uh, like yourself at one, at one time I, I, I was, I, I rapped, uh, you know, I wanted, we had a little group called three deep, uh, shout to Lenny and Lorenzo. Um, and at one point I realized that, eh, you know, I'm, I'm more talented. Uh, my talent lies more with beat making, uh, and rapping as a kid helped me as an MC and it helped me as a songwriter, uh, but it wasn't going to serve me well, probably as a career. I had to be very honest with myself. So I would start off by telling people that have a dream, be honest with yourself. Um, it's the hardest thing to do. You know, once you've been honest, you're honest with yourself and you know where you stand and what you need to do, go full throttle. Uh, at that point, you know, you got to you. Nobody is going to wake you up in the morning. You got to wake yourself up in the morning. Mommy and daddy ain't there or uncle and auntie, whoever raised you. Uh, the people at the home, maybe that you grew up in, they're not there to say it's time to get up. Uh, you got to find that motivation. Um, you have to find 
to find motivation, you have to find inspiration. So find what inspires you, find the gumption within you, know that you have to dis- find the discipline within yourself. Nobody's going to do it. You have to do it. And that, that, that's my advice in a nutshell. Uh, I've used this analogy many times over the years uh, to friends, to, to family, um, to my kids. If, you're, if you want to be a football player, sleep on the football field. Um, that's it in a nutshell. One of the reasons that I can use myself as an example, because I know me better than anybody, I was always doing something with music. If I wasn't DJing a party, I was in my house learning a beat machine, creating beats. Uh, I was writing songs. I was um, on the mic. I I was at at a club watching the DJ. I was at a party. I was soaking it all in. And the the last thing I'll leave you all with is ask questions. You never want to be the smartest person in the room. If you're the smartest person in the room, then you ain't learning shit from anybody. Set yourself up. Put yourself in a position where the majority of the people around you know a lot more than you, because that's how you're going to learn. And if you continue to do that, you'll always be learning. And as long as you're learning, you're gaining knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the closer you are to reaching your goal. And that goes for being a singer, a successful real estate agent. Continue to put yourself around people you can learn from. Don't be lazy and and, and wish for a little bit of the grace of God and a little bit of luck. (laughs) Being at the right place at the right time and being prepared for the opportunity. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. That was great advice. And, you know, Feli, with that being said, man, you know, uh, for anybody that's uh, wondering more about your career, they want to learn more about you, where can they find you online? Instagram, all my social platforms, DJ Feli Fell, DJ F-E-L-L-I-F-E-L. And uh, you can catch me every day, three o'clock, Power 106, Los Angeles, baby. Yeah, that's right. So make sure you guys check out the Feli Fell show. That's Monday through Saturday, like you said. 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific time. Download the Power 106 Los Angeles app and you're listening wherever, wherever you go. We really appreciate you coming on here and just talking to us, talking to the masses, basically giving your side of the story because, uh, you know, I think a lot of people know about you. They listen to you on the radio or they must have heard of you from from elsewhere, but they never really knew who you were. So the fact that we got a chance to sit here with you and just kind of chop it up and just know more about you. Super We're grateful, honored man. to listen to you. I'm like oh, total hey. fan, you know, so just to hear you um, and actually just be, I mean, I feel like we get a piece of who you are, right? Like, I mean, I, I can sense you, all, all that I heard today is not a surprise to me, but uh, <laughs> to be able to have you like break that down and just like really kind of go through your journey was pretty awesome. So thank you for that. No, thank you guys. That means a lot. I really appreciate it. I, I, I'm glad I was able to, 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 to get in the last episode. Yeah, man. I'm a big fan. So I've been. Is it the last yeah. episode? Yeah, this is so, yeah. So this is the last thank, episode thank you, thank you, of season two. And it was yeah. only right, bro. Like it was only right we had you on because yeah. even <laughs> though you're not technically uh, someone that was born in LA, you're basically from LA, man, because you represent yeah, everybody here in California. Like I said, I grew up listening to you. So uh, to me, you're an LA native. I don't care. Hey, <laughs> Rock him. Ra- Eric being Rock him said it best. It ain't where you're from, is where you at. For anybody watching right now or listening, uh, our, our slogan here has always been stay on your grizzly. Uh, I know you got one yourself. So close out the show, man. And tell them what we always tell them. If no one else loves you. <laughs> Belly Fowl loves you. <laughs> That's it. My stay God. on your grizzly. Get, get it. Get it. Pop. Let's get it. Yo, That's what I'm talking about. Hi, and welcome to Trademark Expediters. Whether you need a trademark or copyright, we can help make the process easy and affordable. Protect your company name, logo, or slogan with the trademark. Protect your songs, books, photographs, and other creative works with a copyright. Complete our easy online questionnaire in 15 minutes or less. Clear pricing, no hidden fees. 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Get started today. Learn more at TrademarkExpediters.com or call one of our friendly specialists at 1-800-510-1082. Affordable, easy, expedited service. Trademark Expediters.
Yo, turn it up. Hard work, dedication, and progress. Stay on your Grizzly. Yeah. Thanks for checking out another Grizzly Podcast episode. We'll see you next time.